Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's Aviation Week webinar, Advancements in Lightning Strike Protection Technologies for Composite Aircraft Structures, sponsored by 3M. I'm Hannah Bonnet with Aviation Week, and I'll be moderating today's event. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event, and you may also download a copy of the slides via the green resources widget. Toward the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete a survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click the Help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type your issue into the Q&A area, and we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now on to the presentation, Advancements in Lightning Strike Protection Technologies for Composite Aircraft Structures. Discussing today's topic are Dr. Michael Swan, Senior Development Specialist and Project Manager for 3M Automotive and Aerospace Solutions Division, and Anna Geary, Global New Product Marketing Manager, Aerospace Adhesives for 3M Automotive and Aerospace Solutions Division. Anna, Mike, over to you. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar where we'll be exploring advancements in lightning strike protection. Um, where we'll, we've been looking at uh, exploring new technology advancements um, in materials for composite structures. So the presentation uh, will be delivered um, by primarily by Dr. Mike Swan on the line and myself, Anna Geary. Uh, Mike has uh, been at 3M Company for 34 years um, and has expertise in the fields of magnetic media, fire protection solutions, non-woven and thermal acoustic insulation technologies, RFID, and a wealth of uh, knowledge in adhesive chemistries. For the last 17 years, Mike has had um, a focus on aerospace applications, primarily looking at polysulfide sealant chemistry, um, broad spectrum of adhesive technologies, and um, latterly, lightning strike protection technologies, which we'll be discussing today. He's also a keen aviation enthusiast and a qualified commercial pilot. For myself, um, I've been at 3M Company for 15 years, uh, primarily in marketing and, and uh, commercial roles. Um, and I have spent the majority of that time um, managing and marketing uh, adhesive and tape technologies. And for the last 10 years, that has been focused on aerospace applications. So the agenda for today, um, I'm going to give you a, a whistle stop tour of, uh, of 3M Company and then we'll move into the main body um, of the webinar itself. So we'll explore why lightning strike protection is important uh, for modern aircraft. We'll look at um, surfacing films with built in lightning strike protection and how those can be optimised uh, for design, um, processing and quality and weight reduction. And then finally, we'll end with exploring um, next generation technologies um, in lightning strike protection um, and really um, some exciting developments in that area. So 3M Company. So for those of you that don't know, uh, we're a multinational organization. We have four large um, business groups where we supply um, products for safety and industrial solutions. So personal protective equi equipment, um, general tapes and adhesives, abrasives and so forth. We have a transportation and electronics group. So we do electronic materials. Um, we have an automotive and aerospace division, which is what Mike and I are part of. Um, we have a healthcare, a big healthcare organization, which um, provides solutions for um, oral care, for um, theater, um, medical solutions, um, to name but a few. And then finally, we have a consumer division, um, and you may know us well for our post-it notes. Um, and we also have a, a, a 
plethora of um, products for home improvement markets. So we have a, a very uh, uh, broad presence across the globe. We have sales operations in 200 countries um, and general operations in 70. We've got plant uh, manufacturing plant facilities in 37 countries. For our aerospace um, division uh, that, that Mike and I are, are from and our lightning strike protection material um, derives from, we have four plants, um, two of which are based in, in the US and two of which are based in Europe. But we have R&D capability worldwide, um, primarily in 55 countries. Um, so we're, we're well, well set up to um, service customer needs. And finally, just a little bit about um, our experience in the aerospace industry. So uh, 3M have been operating um, and developing products and solutions for the aerospace industry for the last 65 years. And we started out um, with film adhesives um, in the 1950s and, and moved on to um, pastes uh, in that time uh, and low density void fillers for honeycomb filling uh, and so forth. More latterly, uh, we've been developing composite resins, um, next generation erosion protection films, um, advanced liquid shims, uh, which are are required for these um, modern aircraft where, which are made primarily of uh, composite materials, um, more lightweight uh, structural bonding paste and then composite surfacing and lightning strike protection films which we'll look at um, at, at the, uh, various points in this presentation today. So I'll now hand over to Mike uh, and we'll, we'll get into the content. Anna, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be with you uh, today, this evening, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, look forward to sharing a little bit of information on, on lightning strike and, and why, why we want to talk about it. So starting off here uh, is a, a fairly standard statistic that uh, on average, uh, every aircraft is struck uh, once a year in the commercial fleet. Uh, also, it's safe to say there's, there's over um, 8 million strikes a day that hit the earth and, and uh, that's about 100 times a second lightning's hitting the ground and that's the small number of strikes there's even more strikes occurring from cloud to cloud so it's a, it's a very common natural occurrence uh, phenomena sorry and it's um, something that is bound to hit an aircraft that, that does not result typically in, in any uh, loss of vehicle uh, I think the last recorded accident in the United States was back in uh, 1963 <clears throat> uh, and since then that the, uh, the phenomena of lightning strike has been well understood and how to protect the aircraft. Uh, the, the traditional aircraft structures have have been metal over the years and as, as we transition more to composite structures the uh, potential for damage increases and we'll touch on that briefly on, on some future slides here coming up. The, the consequence really today uh, for lightning strike and the damage it can to aircraft is uh, loss of uh, revenue due to aircraft on the ground uh, that require inspections, potentially repairs if the damage is sufficient, uh, and that can ultimately cause delays in departures and, uh, and passenger disruption, all of which, which need to be avoided. So uh, knowing that aircraft uh, get struck pretty regularly, the, the FAA and, and the other certification agencies around the world have, have defined uh, how to view the aircraft. And I'm not gonna get into the, the detailed complexity of the physics here. There's uh, much smarter people around that can uh, explain that <coughs> in, in more detail if you need. Uh, but suffice to say that when you look at the aircraft, you, you break it into zones uh, where you are most likely to get uh, the high uh, current from an initial strike. So think of sort of pointy bits or, 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 or large chunks of metal. So anywhere that's kind of hmm, highlighted here in, in orange are zone, zone one strike areas. Uh, and those have a, a lot more current, but a typically short attachment period. And then you, you move into zone two where the, the lightning will sweep across the aircraft. Um, 
uh, reattaching multiple times, typically as the aircraft flies through the uh, through the strike. And you can see this in the lower picture with multiple strike points. And then ultimately that strike uh, leaves the aircraft at, at some point, typically at the, at the rear of or trailing edges of, of the surfaces. And uh, that exit point typically doesn't shift too much and uh, protection is often provided in those areas by, uh, by uh, static um, strips that, that stick out from the back of the trailing edges. So each of those zones requires a different degree of, of protection. Um, you know, dealing with the, the high current of an initial strike requires more protection than, than the, uh, the longer, slower burn that occurs during the zone two type strikes. So it's something to just keep in mind when you're, when you're looking at the different uh, lightning strike solutions and, and how they might work and where they might be used on the vehicle. As we already alluded to, metal structures tend to not be as damaged uh, as much as composite structures. So obviously the aluminum structure itself is highly conductive and uh, metal, uh, when struck by lightning, uh, conducts the, uh, the energy away from the strike point very efficiently and, and moves it out to the separation point on the aircraft where it leaves. Typically, you'll see paint damage in the areas where the strike occurs. And depending on the intensity of the strike, uh, anything from a small pinhole burn in the aluminum to a, to a fairly large uh, burnout. I've, I've seen photographs of some fairly substantial damage on metal structures, but that's not typical. Uh, composites, on the other hand, if they're unprotected, will, uh, will basically uh, blow out from the uh, attempts to trans for the energy from the strike point, the photograph down here shows an unprotected composite um, material with the fibers all, all, all pulled out of there. So as a result of that, there is a need to put some form of protection on that outer, outer surface. And that's typically a, uh, a conductor of some sort that uh, will help minimize the, the damage to the structure. The, uh, the typical technologies that, that are used in the industry today, um, I, I kind of have the first group, which is all sort of foil related. You could put a continuous foil on the, on the structure. That, that comes with challenges around um, shop handling and conformability. Uh, and I'll touch on that a little bit uh, when I start talking about some of these other foil based technologies. The most traditional, uh, solution in the industry today is, is expanded copper or aluminum foils. Basically, uh, those are materials that are cut from uh, continuous foil by, by putting slots into them and then stretching the, the foil to create this expanded foil. Um, we at, at 3M and with, with some other partners have been looking at perforated foils. And, and in this case, uh, the technique basically involves cutting specific pattern designs that are, that are optimized to provide performance. And again, I, I will be talking a lot more about that in the next section. Um, less common, but still used are, are woven and interwoven uh, conductive materials. Uh, the, the fiber the conductive fibers are woven in, in the outer layer of fabric that goes onto the structure. Uh, typically uh, are less effective, but uh, certainly more efficient in terms of being able to put them on the, on the aircraft during its build. And then, and then finally, uh, conductive coatings. There's, there's a plethora of solutions that involve spraying and, and applying these types of materials onto, onto the surface. Uh, one of the biggest challenges here is, is, well, there's two challenges. One is to get enough conductivity into those. And the second is to, um, to know exactly how much material you have applied. Uh, not, not things that can't be resolved, but definitely challenges in the use of those materials. So this next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I touched on previously, which is the perforated copper foils and the um, 
and the surfacing resin systems that are used with those. So we really have to think of the foil solutions. And, and if we just think about a traditional expanded copper foil, it, it's, a, um, it's a network of um, fibers, basically, that are joined together at nodes. And you need to fill that with, with resin in order to get a smooth surface. So um, it's important to think about the, the whole system. And you'll see that as we go through this slide deck that that it's a combination of the resin and the conductor that provides this outer surface area onto which the uh, the paint goes. So th there's a there's a, 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 a massive amount of functions that that outer layer has to perform. Obviously, it's providing lightning strike protection. It needs to provide a smooth paintable surface, and, and then it, it also needs to kind of have a bunch of secondary performance requirements in that. Um, it needs to be compatible with the conductor and the underlying structure and uh, prevent uh, micro cracks from forming, which can allow moisture to get in and cause corrosion in the uh, embedded foils. Um, there, there's also the question of removing the paint. So th those uh, systems need to also provide uh, resistance to chemicals used in, in paint stripping and just general hardness. And then of course, in all of these solutions, they need to be repairable after damage. So there's, I won't say there's no solutions out there today, that there are very few solutions available that would result in a, in a no damage situation to the structure. It's a matter of uh, how much uh, protection you want to provide. So I, I, I already kind of maybe touched on much of the content of this slide, uh, but you know the, the surfacing resin is, while a very thin layer in the, the whole structure of the of the skin, performs a you know a very vital function, and and it's important to design the chemistry so that the uh, cure characteristics of the resin system match those of the underlying structure, and uh, that you end up with. Uh, the resin being where you want it. So in the two pictures you see on the side here, um, you, you can get these uh, sort of uh, surface defects. This is a painted uh, piece of skin, one surfaced uh, badly and one surfaced well. Um, and on, on this side here, you can very clearly see this pitting. And that, that often is a challenge because that pitting doesn't show up until you uh, go to paint or until after you've painted it. So when they're when they're preparing the, the skin of the aircraft for painting, it's often sanded and prepped and, and any, any defects are filled. So if, if that resin system can provide a defect-free surface, then the uh, people who are doing the painting operation can uh, very quickly move into that operation and not be surprised by uh, the uh, telegraphing a defect through, through the surface. Um, there's, there's also a lot of time and effort needs to, uh, going into making sure that these surfacing materials have the appropriate uh, shop handling properties. Uh, you, can, you can make them too sticky or not sticky enough. Uh, they need to be able to be stored outside of the freezer for enough time. Uh, it's the first part often that goes on to a, a buildup. And so it, it is often out of the freezer for the longest of all the components used in making a structure. So you need to design these materials to, to have the appropriate out time. Uh, clearly, and we're going to talk about this some more <clears throat> in, in all solutions in aerospace, keeping weight out of the structure is, is also extremely important. And I think I touched on the, these, other, the, these other items already, the, the chemical resistance um, and thermal stability in particular during sort of thermal cycling from the hot, cold uh, exterior skins of the aircraft where you go from minus 65 at, at altitude to uh, you know, plus 120 Fahrenheit. So uh, I just want to sort of explain a little more about the expanded foils versus the perforated foil. In, in the case of an expanded foil, as, as I described earlier, the, the foil itself is cut. 
so there's a slit where I'm sort of indicating with a pointer here, um, and then it and then it's stretched. And what you end up with are these these nodes here between the slits. And and if you look at the cross section of the uh, I'll call them the wires here that that come from this, when you get into these node sections, you have a, an immense amount of copper that is essentially not doing anything electrically. Um, you, you only need a constant cross-section throughout the entire um, network here. So the, there's a lot of excess copper in, in these nodes. And, and what we've been working on is designing a perforation solution that, that doesn't have this excess copper in the node points. So if you look at the cross-section at any given point here in the perforated solution, uh, it's constant throughout, and this is this is how one of the ways in which we're able to take um, a decent amount of weight out of out of the solution. Should also mention that because we're not constrained by the manufacturing process, as in the slip uh, expanded foils here, we can tailor the uh, conductivity in in any direction. So in the picture here, you see there's there's a uh, bias in say so this is the downward direction in this picture. Um, but there's a bias to uh, give us more conductivity in the one direction versus the other. If you took that hexagonal pattern and made it uh, perfectly symmetrical, you could have X and Y conductivity uh, matching each other. You'll see in most of the stuff that we're going to talk about in this presentation, the, uh, the conductance is designed to somewhat mirror what you currently see with an expanded copper foil. So we're deliberately designing a bias into, into that conductor, but that is certainly not something that is, that is needed. Um, in this picture, it's a uh, two A strike zone um, with, a, with a 12, 12 ply composite panel underneath it. The, the panel on the left is, is 170 GSM and that's the total weight of, um, the conductor, and if you see the dots around here, this is uh, where the, the system is grounded, and you can see the damage from the strike here. And this is a 60 GSM, uh, sorry, I keep using the word GSM, that's grams per square meter. Uh, this is a 60 grams per square meter uh, foil using this uh, hexagonal perforation, and you can see that the damage is uh, comparably sized in the same, same test here. An interesting consequence of, of not using the expanded foil technique, but uh, rather the perforation technique is not only can we get um, better use of the metal in it, we also uh, can use thinner foils. And, and as a result of that, a lot less resin is also required. So in, in this sort of pictogram on the top here, we're, we're going from a 70 micron or 76 micron copper used in an expanded copper foil, all the way down to the other extreme where we're using a 12 micron uh, copper foil, which we're perforating. And, and if you look at the, uh, the chart here, you can see that the, the cross web and down web conductivity of, of a, a traditional expanded copper foil, 1.6 uh, to 4.8, and, and then in all the examples that we've given here, the, the resistance is lower in these perforated foils. So, so they have equivalent or better performance. And again, uh, we're just trying to highlight here that you can flip the orientation of, of these foils. And so you can, you can get your conductance uh, in, in either direction. But in all cases, uh, we meet or exceed the, the resistance that um, is currently experienced with the, the 76 micron foil. And, and as a result, a lot less resin used in, in there. And, and the table below, this section of the table shows this very clearly. You've got the uh, conductor weight uh, going from 142 grams per square meter all the way down to 88 grams per square meter here. And the resin content or the resin weight going from 150 down to 55. 
So some really significant overall savings uh, in weight in sort of the extreme examples that we've used here to demonstrate the potential for this type of solution. The, uh, the, the, the transition from a very open, deep type of structure seen here on the left with the expanded copper foil to the more uh, streamlined perforated foil does come with a consequence, and that is that you are now starting to move more towards what the surface would consider to be a continuous foil. And copper in particular doesn't adhere particularly well to uh, epoxy. And with the limited amount of epoxy bleeding through here, you have to start to look at uh, surface treatments on the copper to help uh, with the adhesion of, of the whole system. This is not something that can't or hasn't been resolved, but it's at least something to consider as, as you start to look at the uh, perforated foils in this sort of thinner type of configuration. Here we've just got a, a couple of examples of, of moving from an expanded copper foil into a perforated copper foil. Uh, you know, a traditional 73 gram per square meter foil and uh, 142 grams per square meter expanded copper foil are both uh, pretty standard industry materials. And, and below them, you can see the types of resin and, and ultimately the total weights for the two systems based on expanded copper foil. The, uh, the numbers here underneath the perforated copper foil um, are what we have designed to be electrically equivalent to the uh, 73 grams per square meter material. And you can see what we ultimately end up with is less copper, less resin, resulting in about a 20% reduction in the, the overall weight of the lightning strike solution. And you can extrapolate that uh, weight saving across the uh, the total weight of whatever vehicle you are putting that in. And that's uh, a fairly significant number when you're looking at large aircraft. And, uh, and the weight savings become even more significant when you start looking at the heavier conductors uh, in the 142 grams range, uh, upwards of 26% total weight savings. So pretty exciting technology that can really uh, bring some, some uh, amazing savings. Um, just as an example of, of the resin systems that we're using, this is Air 536. It's a, it's a new 3M dual cure resin system that we're providing with these expanded, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, expanded. We're providing with these perforated copper foils. Um, has all of the features that, that we went through with the appropriate shop handling properties, the appropriate uh, tack. Uh, it's designed to really take the weight out of the aircraft and be easy to use on the vehicle. And, and the last slide in this section is, is just a uh, taken out of our technical data sheet. And I, and I won't belabor the point, but we, we are currently offering this group of materials. We still provide that resin with expanded copper foil, but you can clearly see uh, with these arrows here, you pair that 73 gram per square meter copper with the 60 gram square meter PCF with those uh, 20 to 26 percent weight savings that we have already talked about. Uh, again, if you have any questions specifically about that, you can reach out to either myself or Anna or anybody else at 3M. I'd um, like to touch now on, on two technologies that uh, are more future or forward looking. Uh, the first one is is AFP or automated fiber placement. One one of the challenges with putting lightning strike down today is that it's typically provided in large sheets and is is applied by hand, and this is done on parts that are put together using fairly sophisticated automated equipment. So we challenged ourselves with finding a way to uh, utilize the automated fiber placement equipment used to build parts. And, and come up with a solution that would allow the surfacer itself and the lightning strike to also be put down on the same equipment. Uh, the, the, the photo on, on the right here shows a, a Coriolis uh, automated fiber placement machine. 
And on the very right of this picture, you can see a tool where we were running some, some trials. On the left, you can see uh, the green, which is our surfacing material color. And that is a, a fiber placed uh, lightning strike and surfacing in, in the tool there. And on the next slide, I'll show you a video of it's been sped up of the of the lightning strike being put down on this uh, more complex tool here with with uh, compound curves associated with it. Uh, what we have demonstrated to date with this is first of all that um, the the material itself can go successfully through a Coriolis machine uh, with with no special treatment associated with it. Um, it it sticks well to the tool when when it's applied and from a design point of view, and, and I'll touch on this on the next slide, you can put down these uh, individual strands to either give, uh, you know, I, I'll talk about it on the next slide, but the, the degree of coverage that you use or get with, with the AFP can be varied. So this is sort of, uh, if you will, the conclusion of our trials from, from this original what was the second time at Coriolis. Uh, we, we've shown that it feeds through the system without jamming. We don't get a uh, hang up in the system. Uh, we don't see uh, uh, resin accumulation and, and you know, the resin in the surfaces is different to the resin in the primary structure. So that's, that's a challenge that we've overcome and that we have sufficient tack in it to, to stick to the tool. This is uh, a, a photograph of, of the um, fibers or, or the AFP conductive material. You can see the oriented strand type uh, cuts here. Again, we're using the same basic principle that I talked about in the previous section uh, for the perforated foils. Rather than trying to make an expanded foil here, we are, we are perforating a deliberate pattern in here to give us the performance that we need both electrically and mechanically. You'll notice that you know when you cut the edge here, we have a smooth edge to this, which helps it inside the Coriolis machine as it goes through the head. And then, as I was talking about a few minutes ago, the, the patterning of the conductor can be uh, uh, tailored depending on how much protection you want from the system. It, you can put down a checkerboard, as you can see in this photograph here. You can 100% cover it in both directions. And then you can sort of back away from that 100% coverage and, and do various degrees of coverage depending on, on what type of protection you want. And then ultimately, as you can see from this uh, table down here, we, you, know, you can go from a fairly heavy solution at 200 grams all the way down to 100 gram per square meter uh, conductor. So this uh, is a video of the, uh, the material being put down, and I'm told that it will not work in the slide deck here. So I'm going to just back out of there for a second and try and find that video. Go. Hopefully you can see this okay. We've we've increased the speed about uh, 5x just so that you can see the the whole part being put down here. So we're doing 100% coverage, uh, and in a minute you'll see it going into the uh, fairly complex shape here. Works absolutely uh, beautifully now. Uh, very excited by this. So this is something we just want to make you aware of that that this is based on we'll say fairly traditional lightning strike solutions uh, as you can see in this photograph here um, it's it's a uh, it's a conductive foil um, it's using pretty standard resin systems so the, there's nothing um, terribly complicated about what this looks like ultimately. Obviously, it was not an easy thing to accomplish, but we would be delighted to talk to anyone who has uh, any questions on, on this and how this could be used to speed up production.
Okay, uh, the last part of this uh, presentation is to talk about uh, what personally I think is one of the most uh, amazing technologies that I've probably seen in my entire career. Uh, something that Larry Abair developed, and hopefully he'll be able to join us for the questions. It's it's basically a, a novel way of of really looking at how you handle the energy when lightning strikes the aircraft. Um, you you have obviously, as we discussed earlier, a, a lot of energy. You know, fifty thousand degrees of heat in in, a, in an arc from a lightning strike. You have the uh, the sonic um, impulse from from that. As, as it heats the air around it, which is you know what we hear when we hear a, a thunder from a lightning strike. Uh, all, all of those, are, you know, how do we um, how do we manage that energy and, and move it away from that strike point to minimize or even potentially eliminate the damage uh, to to the structure un underneath it? I've got a couple of pictures here. Um, the, the one on the left um, is taken, and, and you'll see a video in a little bit of this. It's, it's towards the tail end of a, a lightning strike on, on a composite panel protected with a traditional expanded copper foil. And what you're really seeing there is a, is a concentrated burn in a single point. And effectively, the, the lightning is boring a hole into the structure until it separates and moves to its next attachment point. On, on the photo on the top right, you can see some little fingers coming down from the lightning. Um, and what, what we're doing here is um, causing the lightning to um, be driven across the surface. So we're kind of controlling the where the arc is attaching and how it's moving uh, across the surface. And as a result, we can uh, dissipate the energy over a larger area and, and mini minimize the, the damage. And, you know, this statement at the bottom here is we're really going to some kind of a guided attachment. We we want we want to control how and where the lightning attaches and how long it stays there for. So the the, the structure that that's been designed to do this, and there's a photograph on on the bottom left here. You can see these little hill-like features sticking up. Uh, just visible on the top uh, of this uh, composite layup here, uh, and this uh, images here from the from a patent show where the the conductor is. It's, it is actually a continuous foil in this case. It's a multi-layer structure that has been designed to manage the energy and increase the resistance during during a strike event, and I'll, I'll touch on that on the next slide. So the, the idea really ultimately here is that, that, that lightning will tend to preferentially attach at these high points, and then, and then it can be moved away. And I'll, I'll explain on the next slide why the lightning doesn't just stay on one of those high points, but continuously moves around. So, um, I think this is animate. Here we go. Yeah. So the lightning strike will attach, or, or one of the streamers will will attach to the skin. It'll, as electricity always does, will go for the path of least resistance, which would be the top of one of these uh, points here. As the uh, as the lightning attaches, the conductor is heated, and as it's heated, uh, we, I mentioned that multi-layer uh, uh, structure. It's designed so that the uh, resistance will start to increase dramatically. And as the resistance increases, uh, the, the lightning will preferentially move to the next peak that's near it. Um, and the same event will happen again. And, and then the lightning moves again. So basically, you're driving the lightning around by the uh, material properties of the conductor uh, responding to the heat. And that cycle just repeats throughout the entire strike. Um, really, really very cool. There's a bit of animation here. 
what 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 Larry has achieved here is frankly incredible. So we're looking at um, you know 10, 10 micron thick layer of conductor in, in a continuous uh, structured foil, uh, very low resistance, you know, much lower than traditional expanded copper foil. Certainly the lightweight copper foils, but but at a much sort of at a comparable weight. Sorry, I keep having problems with the, the pictures not moving. This this is um, and what I'm going to show in the video in a minute is is two strikes. We'll show um, the panels are, are 10 by 10, as you can see from the description here. Um, You'll see a lot of paint damage and, and and charring on the surface on the on on the novel lightning strike protection solution. On the on the other one, the uh, the damage is is substantial and throughout the material. So on the back here, in fact, you can see uh, the plies have been uh, pushed out, and there's there's been sort of damage from the impulse from the strike. As well as the burning and charring that occurs on the front side. Uh, in this example here, the the damage is is basically non-existent, other than the the paint has been burnt off the the top side of the lightning strike. So, oops, I'm sorry. I'm going back to the previous slide there. So in, in summary, this this is a this is a novel solution. Um, unlike the perforated foils we talked about at the beginning, or, or the automated fiber placement, it's a different way of protecting the aircraft, and and as such, needs a different way of thinking about how it can be used. Obviously, we now have a continuous foil uh, which can provide some enhanced uh, shielding performance. Uh, we've demonstrated that um, it works very effectively in a 2A strike zone area, even with nearly 400 microns of paint on it, uh, with a conductor down at 88 grams per square meter. So let's move on to the last slide, which is a, a video. And for those of you that I've got to drop out of this presentation again here, I'm sorry about this. Uh, but for those of you who have not seen the lightning strike before, uh, what we're doing here is looking on the top of the panel. Um, we've got the electrode here, which is a round ball that's above the surface of, of the panel itself. And I will click play here and see if it, if it starts to work. So this is a side view. This is the uh, white painted surface. You can see a faint wire here, which initiates a strike onto the surface. This is a high speed, 40,000 frames a second. And this first one is, is striking a panel with traditional expanded copper foil on it. And as if you recall from the previous slides, uh, what, we're, what we're looking at here is essentially just uh, a burn through in, in, in that area. This is just a short section of the whole uh, strike because at 40,000 frames a second, that would take quite a long time. But you can see by the end of it, there's a hole in, 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 the, in the structure there. And th there's the damage effectively burning through that outer layer. And here um, we can see now all of the individual attachment points um, and, and that behavior that I described earlier, the lightning just doesn't know where it wants to attach. And so just constantly walks around the surface. Um, like we said, taking paint off the surface, but uh, doing no damage to the underlying structure. So both those images or those high speed images were the same strike on the same panel with the two different protections. And, then, and here you can see 
Uh, the damage to the surface, basically just the paint got some slight charring on it. So um, that, that concludes my presentation. I appreciate you spending the time to listen to us. And we're now going to open up to uh, questions and answers. So just before we begin today's Q&A, please direct your attention to our webinar survey available on the right of the presentation window. If you close the survey, you can reopen a widget by clicking on the clipboard icon along the bottom of your screen. And thank you so much in advance for filling out the feedback form. It really helps us serve you better for future webinars. We have had lots of questions come in about the slides, and please be assured that you'll receive a personalised follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. But for now, let's move on to the Q&A portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, just type your question into the text box located to the left of the presentation window, or click the purple Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. I don't think we'll be able to answer all of the questions submitted today because we've had tons come in, but if not, we'll be sure to share them with our, spe our speakers who can apply to you offline. So, Mike, one of the first questions that came in was just asking if you can expand on how the pattern can be optimized for cross, for down or cross web performance. Thank you, Hannah. Um, yes, basically, the, the hexagonal shape uh, can be designed to uh, give optimized conductivity where you want it. So if you imagine a uh, just a straight hexagon, uh, you would have basically uh, comparable behavior in all, all orientations. And then as you uh, elongate that hexagon, either in the cross web or down web direction, you'll give preferential uh, conductivity in the direction of the elongation. And, and of course, which way you lay that on the path will also dictate which way that uh, preferential conductivity goes. Anna. We had another one asking, um, how do I know which copper and resin weight combination to select for my application? Thank you. Yeah, the, the, that, that's um, an interesting question. The, uh, the conductor itself broadly is, is something that, that um, needs to be defined between the the OEM and the certifying agency. Now, for a given conductor weight in traditional expanded copper foil, 3M can guide you very clearly to the appropriate uh, perforated copper foil that will give comparable performance. So we can certainly assist there. And then in, in regards to the resin itself, um, we can um, define that resin weight to give you the best surfacing performance for the conductor system that's being being used. So if it's, a, if it's a heavier conductor, we can provide the solution with more resin in it. Or if it's going onto a uh, part that is particularly uh, complicated and has a lot of low pressure zones that tend to cause porosity, we can work with you to define the resin there. Anna. Thanks, Mike. One of the attendees asked if the ASP solution is available today and how they can trial it. Okay, um, the AFP is not a commercially available solution today. We, we have materials and we'll be happy to work with anybody that's interested in looking at it. So we'll reach out to you and uh, anyone else who's interested in that after the webinar. We have another attendee asking um, how PCF is made from metal foil. Yeah, that um, you know, I think I explained in in the uh, presentation that expanded copper foil is just stretched from uh, slips put into in, into copper foil, and the perforation is basically uh, taking the same foil, but uh, you can use multiple techniques to to put those perforations in there. From uh, well, traditional perforation would be a mechanical embossing of of the shape, and there are many other ways that that can be done. 
Okay. Can you talk about the repairability of these various oil applications? Certainly. Um, expanded copper foil, as I, I told you, has been used extensively on, on composite aircraft for a considerable amount of time now. And uh, OEMs and the MROs have worked out good schemes for repairing those types of things. Uh, the, the perforated copper foil doesn't fundamentally change how, how composite structures are, are handled when it comes to repairing. So if you have to cut out a section and put a new piece in, you would use the, the same technique that, that you would use today for an expanded copper foil solution. One of the questions that came in said that carbon fiber and some other composites are conductive asking about any special protective techniques or application procedure changes. I'm, I'm sorry, could, could you repeat that question again then? Sure, sorry Mike. One of the questions that came in said, carbon fiber and some other composites are conductive. Any special protective techniques or application procedure changes? The, the, the short answer to that is no, we, uh, would not expect any changes in, in how that would be handled and protected. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came in said, dramatic weight savings. How commercial is this product? So, yes, the, uh, the, uh, the perforated copper foil, I assume that was uh, what that question was related to, is commercially available now. Uh, we have a portfolio of offerings that we, we showed in the presentation and we'll be happy to share with you. So if you would like to get samples of any of those materials, they can be uh, arranged to be shipped down. Okay, we've got somebody asking if it's commercially available or in development. I think it's the same question, but yes, commercially available for the um, perforated foils, the the other two solutions are both in development, so the AFP, obviously we're making enough material, but it is not commercially available yet. And so the, the last solution that we showed that we call it the advanced conductor solution at the end, uh, that, that is a bit further back in development and we'll be looking to partner with somebody to drive that forward in the future. We've got a question um, asking what's the recommended techniques to electrically bond between seams and panels? We, we would not recommend any change to the current method user. Again, I'm assuming we're talking about the expanded copper foil here versus the perforated copper foil. Um, both, both would be handled and managed in exactly the same way. Okay, fantastic. Well, Mike, thank you so much for, for taking part. And um, before we like, before we sign off, I'd like to thank you and Anna and our sponsor, 3M. Uh, just a reminder that within the next 24 hours, all attendees will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. And please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to the event. If you have joined late or had any audio issues, um, that will be shared with you very soon. Thank you so much for attending and have a wonderful remainder of your day. Thank you.